And um, I have worked in fine art auction houses like Sotheby's and Phillips. Um, I worked at a, a pretty large um, appraisal and advisory firm for fine art, jewelry, and other collectibles. Um, and there, that company specialized in appraisals for all different types of insurance purposes, um, estate planning, and loan collateral appraisals. Um, so loan collateral, it's a, it's a topic that doesn't necessarily come up very much, but it's a, like if you need to uh, take out a loan against your entire collection. Um, and then also I've worked at, at um, AXA Art Insurance, um, which is a, a very large art insurance provider for private and uh, public collections. Um, that was uh, quite a while ago. Um, I worked there uh, actually during a Superstorm Sandy here in New York and got to kind of do a lot of the cleanup um, uh, when uh, galleries in Chelsea got damaged. Um, and then lastly, the last bullet point I put in here, which is kind of fun, is um, I used to sell insurance company fine art salvage. So that's kind of when fine art jewelry or collectibles of any sort got damaged. Insurance companies really don't want to own damaged objects. So I would be appointed as their broker uh, to ethically sell these objects uh, to people who are interested in them. Um, I also don't know why I wrote this in the third person, but I did. But currently, I spearhead a cutting edge uh, digital first uh, insurance product for collectible watches. Um, it's called Hodinkee Insurance. If you want to Google it and sign up, I'm always looking for new clients. Um, and we're uh, going to be expanding into different collecting categories imminently. Uh, so keep an eye out for an announcement from us uh, probably on Monday. Um, I also dropped a term called use path in the last slide, which is um, uh, basically kind of like the minimum standard for what um, an appraiser, at least in the United States, uh, should be. Um, use path, um, it's kind of a, a weird word, but it stands for Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. Uh, it's a set of standards and guidelines that government uh, that govern the appraisal profession here in the U.S. Um, it basically uh, was established to promote and maintain a high level of professionalism, consistency, and ethics within the appraisal industry. Uh, essentially, it sets guidelines for what uh, an appraiser needs to do from a methodology perspective and what an appraisal report should include. Uh, it really is there to uh, bolster the public trust. Um, the use path, while it is a United States based uh, set of standards, uh, really um, it is adopted as the uh, the the framework within a lot of uh, within which a lot of other appraisers internationally work within. Um, so to my knowledge, there's no real proxy to this in um, Asia, Africa, South America, um, or or really the EU. Um, but um, whenever I've worked on uh, appraiser, appraisals within those geographic uh, boundaries, uh, we still follow use path, uh, just because the standard is generally considered to be uh, one that's recognized. Um, so now I want to move on to like what types of appraisals are there. Um, so a USPEP compliant appraiser can generate a lot of different types of appraisals. Um, and before taking on a project, uh, an appraiser will ask you a lot of questions to determine like what type of um, report is good for you. Um, and it's broken up really into what types of values you need. If you need a fair market value appraisal, um, a retail replacement value appraisal, which is also known as insurance appraisals, or marketable cash value. Um, underneath fair market value, you've got things for estate planning. So let's say you are uh, trying to prepare for the inevitable, or uh, you do pass away, your uh, beneficiaries or your executor has to then obtain an estate appraisal to value basically the contents of your life. Uh, so basically assigning a value to every single object that you have ever, that you own. Um, equitable distribution, that's used in um, divorce circumstances. So let's say um, it's a very acrimonious divorce and um, people decide, and, and the, uh, the spouse has decided that they can't come up with a way to fairly 
divide objects in their tangible form. They would rather just uh, liquidate everything. So really an equitable distribution appraisal is then called upon to uh, value, similar to an estate, estate planning appraisal, everything within the home. Uh, then there's kind of the most common appraisal that everyone thinks about, which is a donation appraisal. So when you want to donate something to a museum or to a nonprofit, you get a donation appraisal. Uh, then you have something called a market research, which is, um, I just think of it as a general inquiry and general knowledge appraisals. Uh, you're just curious about what something is worth. Uh, and also then a rental value. So this is um, really interesting. It's kind of popped up in the last couple of years where you get an appraisal to determine the uh, the object's rental value. Uh, and this comes into play when uh, people do some very... Um, fancy accounting where you put artworks into a trust and then you rent them back from the trust to hang them on your wall. So you need to determine what the rental value is. Um, moving on to the insurance value. So basically you need it to obtain coverage for some really valuable pieces or collections. Um, and then also you would need it in the case of a damage or a loss. So you try to find out uh, a percentage that an object has lost value. Um, after a uh, after damage has occurred. Uh, and lastly is marketable cash value for loan collateral. Um, so really like what is the determining factor between those three different types of values? Uh, it comes down to really these three components, uh, the venue or the market where the artwork is going to be sold, uh, the comparables that you're looking at, and also the timeline. Um, so for a perfect example, um, fair market value, you always want to look at objects sold on the secondary and public market. So that means auction. Uh, your comparables have to be publicly uh, listed uh, at a within a reputable database. And the time aspect of it, there's really no time constraint. Uh, really, fair market value is the value between a, a willing buyer and a willing seller. So it could take you in theory months to find a willing buyer for your object. So fair market value is typically um, uh, a bit lower than retail replacement value, for example. Retail replacement value assumes that uh, an object has to be quote, replaced within the retail market um, due to something like a loss or a damage. And it also assumes that there's a time constraint on that. Typically, um, appraisers work with a time constraint of 30 days. So when they look to, uh, uh, to come to a retail replacement value, they're looking for objects that are currently on sale at galleries um, at that time. They're not looking at what was an object similar to this sold for at a gallery six months ago. They're looking for what is the sale price right now. So typically, retail replacement value is often the highest form of value. Um, and then lastly, marketable cash value um, is essentially, you know, it's used for that really like one purpose of loan collateral, although I've seen it used in a couple of other instances. Um, and typically, marketable cash value appraisals assume the worst. So you've defaulted on a loan and the bank needs to then take possession of the artwork that's been collateralized and has to sell it essentially incredibly quickly. So really marketable cash value appraisals are uh, taken to this huge discount in terms of time um, and also the market. You may not be able to go to public auction. You may have to just sell it um, to the first buyer. Um, so really there's often a huge discount associated with marketable cash value for a work of art. By the way, like I know I left time for Q&A at the end, but if anyone has questions, like inter interject, we're a really small and intimate group, so I don't mind stopping at any point. Um, so now it's kind of like, go, it goes to the question of why should you get art appraise, appraised at all? Um, art appraisals may not be top of mind when someone is buying a new piece of art, but it is kind of the ideal time to really um, give that individual that idea. Uh, an appraisal can add value to the buying process and serve several important purposes. Uh, the first is a precise valuation. Uh, the second is it helps uh, uh, protect an object when you want to take out an insurance policy. Um, it also enhances the resale value of a, of a work of art. And it also assists with um, investment protection, which is, I think, the um, most interesting 
uh, purpose of an appraisal from my perspective. And I'll go into all of these. So um, a precise valuation um, is at the point of sale or during negotiations, and a, se a seller may offer to include a complimentary appraisal of the item being sold as a, as a vote of confidence that their asking price is, a, is appropriate. Often this is provided by a neutral third party, but sometimes the seller provides it after the fact. Um, in the latter instance, it's less a vote of confidence and more seen as like an added service or benefit uh, to the sale. So I think this comes into play most often with uh, less fine art, but more jewelry. So a lot of uh, people, when they buy like an engagement ring from a, a jewelry store, the jewelry store will throw in a complimentary appraisal post-sale. And it's really meant to kind of give either a vote of confidence or make or the sale a bit easier because the buyer uh, gets something in addition to the object they're buying. Uh, hey, so Mark, and, sorry, can I ask a quick question? Uh, this is Charles Spent um, yeah. here, even though you can't see me. So like in this scenario that you just mentioned with the jewelry, is that typically going to be something like a retail replacement value? And the reason it's sort of a leading question, but you know, like I've heard the story that you, if you go to, I don't know, Zales or something, buy yeah. a one carat diamond, it's worth $10,000. You walk out of the store and you bring it back in and they say, oh, it's now worth $3,000. Um, I'm just wondering how they finesse that kind of discrepancy. Exactly. So the so that's actually a perfect point, Charles. So yes, they they will more often than not. Um, I don't know Zales practices, but um, those sorts of like appraisals that a a jewelry store would give would be retail replacement value. Um, okay. Because, yeah, because then the the whole mindset is you then can take that appraisal to your insurance company to uh, obtain. Okay. Value. Yeah. Got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, where were we? Uh, the next one is, it kind of leads right into that, is insurance protection. Um, so one such professional service that an appraisal assists with is obtaining insurance protection. Um, a prime example of this is actually that a lot of homeowners or renters policies like, you know, that we would all have on our standard, uh, on our uh, homes, um, they have really low thresholds for what's considered art or jewelry. Um, and typically depends on like who your carrier is, like State Farm difference differs from Allstate from Lemonade to Chubb. Um, but typically your standard homeowners or renters policy maxes out at like $5,000 for a valuable piece of jewelry or for art. Um, so these appraisals can allow you to then get uh, additional, what, what's called like a rider on the policy, um, or take out a special valuable articles policy uh, that can ensure the object for its full value in the event of a loss. Um, and uh, a really interesting story that I'm going to tell now is kind of like this case study of um, a Rudolph Stingel painting that I had the, the ability to work on several years ago. Um, so for kind of everyone in, in the group here, um, Rudolph Stingel um, is a contemporary artist. He's still alive. He's known for these large scale uh, paintings. They're called like carpet paintings because they have like carpet like patterns on them. But he paints these with um, very metallic uh, materials. And back in like 2016, 2017, he was a super hot artist. His paintings were selling for uh, like upwards of a million dollars. And uh, we were, and we did an appraisal on a work that looked very similar to this. Um, and the value was about $4 million. Uh, and it was insured at $4 million. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the owner of the work stored it improperly he stored it uh, in a basement because he was uh, a dealer uh, and it was under a leaky pipe. So you can imagine that water interacting with this very metallic surface actually caused the painting to rust completely. Um, and we were then called back in to do a, uh, a salvage value appraisal and ultimately sell it. Does anyone want to take a stab at what the uh the salvage value was calculated at one million dollars okay well i got i have one million <laughs> <laughs> uh 
it was actually calculated at uh, much lower than that. So it was very, uh, it was kind of jarring, but the salvage value was unfortunately only $400,000. Oh, wow. um, so basically what then happens in that situation is because the customer or the owner insured it at $4 million, they got paid $4 million by the insurance company but the insurance company then had to sell it for four hundred thousand dollars. So um, it really oh, Kirby was close. Sorry, she had, she suggested five hundred k. Oh, he or she? Yeah. Sorry, he or she. <laughs> yeah, five hundred. Yeah, Kirby. Okay, Kirby, you're close. So <laughs> yeah, so it's um you know I just I pulled this example really to kind of show that you know you could be dealing with the same work of art. But when you look at it through different lenses and different circumstances, the value that is um, uh, that it is appraised to be can be completely different. Um, uh, so the next reason you get an appraisal switching topics here is like to enhance the resale value. So this kind of gets to Charles, your earlier point of like, well, you know, does sales give appraisals at the point of sale, you know, to enhance the resale value? The answer for that is no. Um, so while not a requirement by any means to resell artworks or collectibles on the secondary market, appraisals can help enhance the price you ask. Um, for example, uh, John is on the market to purchase a painting by a well-known artist. Mm -hmm. John found several paintings by the artist for resale on a reputable online marketplace, all within his budget and parameters. However, mm -hmm. only one painting is accompanied by a previous appraisal from when the current owner purchased it. And uh, John chose that painting to buy because the appraisal assists with provenance verification should he ever need it. So um, just having an appraisal on hand serves as kind of, um, it, it, it's essentially a paper trail that future buyers uh, and future sellers can use should they ever need it. Mark, if I can just ask one clarification, sorry to hold everyone up, but uh, so like in that scenario, when you initially said it, I was thinking that the appraisal function would be to give the like the proposed buyer sort of peace of mind that there's like an independent entity verifying its like market value. But if I'm hearing you right, that is partly true, but it's more an issue of the diligence that is done by the appraiser for that artwork in terms of like authenticity, title, import, export, what have you, that they can feel uh, confident knowing that it's an authentic work, like in certain condition and that it's been passed like through the chain of custody in a legal way. Yeah. So like, I think even looking at it from like a, a bit like a, of a higher level, Charles is like, it, it, it just means that like a third party with expertise in the subject matter has mm -hmm. has looked at has examined the work and has researched it. Okay. Um, appraisal appraisers like can't authenticate work. Um, we mm -hmm. like there have been a lot of people who have gotten hot, into hot water for okay. uh, even attempting that. Mm -hmm. But really, it's just you know it, it's proving that a third party with knowledge and expertise has vetted it in some capacity. Uh, okay. Yeah. So cool. yeah, exactly. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, which is the most interesting purpose of an appraisal, in my opinion, is investment protection. Um, so in an ever-changing market where alternative assets are gaining popularity, how do you make sure your art collection isn't subject to the same volatile market forces? Um, and the best example I have of this is actually the artist Keith Haring. Um, so, you know, I just pulled this quick snapshot of public sales records from Artsy of Keith Haring works. And you can see that um, in early February of, 2020, uh, of 2012, Keith Haring's were selling pretty good. They were selling either at or slightly above its their estimates. But then come the April sales season in 2012, they all just started to buy in. And why is that? And that's because um, the Keith Haring Foundation around that time or just before those auctions had announced that they would stop authenticating Keith Haring works. So essentially the market negatively reacted to this announcement that the that the authentication committee would stop uh, uh, basically blessing 
all Keith Haring works as authentic. Um, so what does this mean and how does an appraisal help with this? Well, the appraisal wouldn't help you sell the work on the public market and achieve a certain price, but it would assist you in the event of a loss of that work of art, where if you had an appraisal solidifying your Keith Haring's value at those pre-market levels, at, at the time of a loss after this announcement, you would be guaranteed to be paid out that pre-announcement level. Whereas if you didn't have an appraisal, um, your uh, appraiser would then have to look at the recent news within the marketplace of authentication. So it's um it's really just this interesting use of an appraisal uh, to kind of hedge against secondary market forces by using insurance values. It, it, sorry, Mark, it's me again. Um, no, it's I, fine. I, no, no, I want I want questions. I want uh, questions. So this is this is fascinating. Um, the what is the type of appraisal that is used in this case? Yeah, so this is retail replacement value because it's for insurance. Um, and the entire mindset with with this is that um, insurance values and scheduling works of fine art on an insurance policy mm -hmm. is really the only form of, quote, investment protection that uh, collectors have. Because you can try to diversify your portfolio am uh, amongst, you know, uh, up and coming artists, blue chip artists, mm -hmm. you know, sculptors, works on paper. You can diversify it all you want, but if you're you're still still tied to the auction market and mm -hmm. what the values of the auction market dictate to really impact your um, investment returns, mm -hmm. and in the event of a loss, uh, your appraiser kind of has to take into consideration the current market. Mm -hmm. However, if you're diligent and get everything appraised for insurance purposes and you schedule everything for insur on your insurance policy, really that insurance policy is the only true form in, of investment protection you could have in the event of a market downturn. Uh, okay, so again, just um, if I'm hearing you right, if you are managing your own collection properly and getting like a sort of standard pro forma updated appraisal on a regular basis, you could then use that if an you learn that one of the uh, artists in your collection the often changes. And then at that point, if you had some sort of insurance policy pre-existing, it would allow you to mark the value to the pre-authenticity change. Is that right? Ex mm, let's uh, <laughs> sort of, sort of. It's basically, um, it's essentially that Getting like this and getting a, a retail replacement value for insurance mm -hmm. um, allows you to schedule it at that value on your insurance policy. Um, and let's say then the auction market for that same artist or those mm -hmm. or similar works nosedives mm -hmm. after you schedule it on that policy or at any point during the policy's lifetime, mm -hmm. the insurance company can't look at that auction market and that downturn because in theory you're paying the premiums on the value you scheduled it at on the that it was appraised for ah got it okay yeah. and is that called an investment protection policy no 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 that's that is honestly that's basically just your standard valuable articles policy um, oh wow okay yeah from like a, a chub and aig a pure and you're basically just and you're just using a standard retail replacement value appraisal it's really just it's this 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 mindset that you can use the you can use an insurance policy as investment protection yeah that's super interesting okay now i get it thank you yeah no 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 problem um and then you know essentially i i wanted to uh kind of provide an example of like what an appraisal looks like um so this is what's called like a, a simplified appraisal report so it's, you know, typically uh, a simplified a report is only a couple pages long. You can get a, a, a standard appraisal is much larger. It's got a lot more, let's call it legalese in the front and in the back. However, um, both this simplified report and the full version are, are both use PAP compliant. The only difference is that all that quote legalese I was mentioning for this simple simplified report is retained by the appraiser in their files um, and can be given upon request. It's just that sometimes clients don't want, you know, a 25 page document for one or two 
works being appraised. They're just like, you know, just give me, I just want to see the values. Just show me the values. Um, and then I wanted to kind of like throw this in there um, about like how does like an artist value their art? So it's this isn't really an appraisal, but this is a frequently asked question that I get. Um, so how do artists determine uh, the values for their work and like what it, what are the best practices of there? And really, I kind of give these handful of tips, which is uh, research the market and what your peers are pricing their works at. Um, take commissions into considerations. Like if you're if you're working through a gallery or a marketplace, you know, take those into consideration. Um, the third bullet point is uh, size actually really matters. Um, you may think that uh, a smaller format work is a better example of of your style and, and your practice, but really you have to price it accordingly with with a larger work. Like larger works are always assumed to be more expensive than smaller works. Uh, the fourth bullet point is keep it consistent with minimal fluctuations. Um, a prime example of this is I was actually at um, an open studios for a particular artist um, a couple of weeks ago, and I bought a small work about this size. Um, and a friend of mine was considering buying a work that was about double the size, but the price fluctuation was 6x. Um, and ultimately, my friend was like, I don't really, you know, care about how much I like it. At this point, I can't justify paying 6x for something that's only double the size. Um, so really take that into consideration, as well as um, looking at and considering feedback um, and willingness to take a discount or adjust a price if you're receiving um, you know, comments from potential buyers that your prices are out of line. Um, and then how are appraisals used in art or collectible investing? Um, so they play an active role in this. So you can determine or uh, it, it's it, it helps in determining or verifying an asset's value. Um, it ha it assists with um, asset allocation decisions. So you know you can figure out if you're too heavily invested in one category versus another. Um, and also helping to determine when's the most appropriate time to sell. Um, oftentimes, like the appraiser has their pulse on the market and they can tell you, you know, after a, a report's been completed, they can say something to the extent of, you know, this artist is at their peak, you might consider selling, um, or this art, you know, they can, it also helps you identify when you've passed a peak of an artist's work, because if you're getting, um, you know, some of the, the the big collectors that I've worked on over the years, they get appraisals as often every six months. That's very frequent. I wouldn't suggest doing that for your average individual, but they really at that point have a, a, their finger on the market and they can see in real time almost like the fluctuations of a market. Um, an appraisal can also help extract value without selling pieces. Think, uh, you know, in terms of collateral loan. Helps with estate planning. Um, obviously insurance covered coverage we talked about. And also lastly, general housekeeping and collection management. Um, I could not tell you the amount of times clients have referenced actually very old appraisals when they're doing things like moving houses. You know, they can't, they give the appraisal over to their movers and they say, this is what needs to be packed up. And it helps them in getting a quote for a move. Um, it, it's just useful to have an inventory even. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, I put my email here, which is the email I use for kind of art appraisal inquiries. You're welcome to email me. Um, I want to open up the floor for the last like 15 minutes with any questions. Mark, I definitely have a question. Uh, yes. <laughs> that's okay. And again, sorry if this isn't, uh, probably sort of relevant to, to everyone here. Because uh, I'm coming at it from a very targeted perspective, but I just I wanted to sort of hoping that you could shed some light for me on the thought of uh, or the concept of like an appraisal first time versus updating appraisals yeah. and the requirement to be done uh, in person, right? Like in my time at Sotheby's, it was just always hammered into us that first hand inspection was required. And, yeah. you know, even if we were moving a valuable painting from the 10th floor to the fifth floor, it would almost have to be formal, like reevaluated by either our art handlers or experts. And we're just wondering if you had any view on that in terms of like the way that you guys operate, sorry, not you guys, the way that appraisals are done these days 
and then the push into doing everything digitally and like whether there is opportunity to start doing more remote appraisals rather than bringing the object to the expert or vice versa. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I, so I know exactly the angle you're coming at because, uh, like Sotheby's, Christie's, all the major auction houses, their prime, the, the primary appraisal that they're doing all the time is for estate uh -huh. tax purposes. Okay. So the IRS in those instances will usually require the object be seen. Um, okay. Because if it's not seen in person, that could be interpreted as like uh, an appraiser's like dereliction of their duty or, um, you know, it, you can't always ascertain uh, condition if you yeah. have if you're just working from digital images. So, like for estate tax purposes, any really any sort of fair market value appraisal, mm -hmm. it has to be inspected. When you do insurance, is a totally different story. You know, you just basically default. I would default to whatever the insurance carrier is requiring. Sometimes they'll require in person. Other times they'll be like, doesn't matter. You could do a desktop appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, reappraisals um that really just depends um you rarely like after someone has passed away with an estate tax appraisal you rarely need to do a reappraisal you the only time that may need to be done is like if a painting gets kicked to like the irs um like the IRS, what's it called? Like the fine art panel mm -hmm. and they kick it back down and say like, this value is wrong. Um, if you're doing it pre-death as kind of like preparatory work, mm -hmm. um, those reappraisals can be totally digital. Like you, you just, you know, it can just be like the appraiser has the old file. They'll just update the values, you know, through research. Okay. Um, Sometimes the appraiser will say like, hey, can I see the more the, the most expensive items? That way, because mm -hmm. condition is always a concern. Mm -hmm. um, for insurance, I've only seen the carrier mandate in-person inspections on a reappraisal. If it's like a, a mega client or if the client, if or if like there's been a history of, of claims in the past. Okay. And um, could I ask you about that specifically with MCV, marketable cash value? Yes. Um, so, yeah. And also just to spill the beans, and I'm sorry if I'm oversharing, but basically I'm trying at my new job to create a digital art financing platform where we could mm -hmm. offer loans on existing collections, but we're trying to offer them in like the $100,000 range and up. Whereas mm -hmm. like in the market today, the minimum is about a million dollars, largely because the underwriting cost and the appraisal cost is so expensive and so we're trying to suss out like if digital mc if mcvs could be completed through digital images or if there still is that requirement to do it firsthand yes honestly like that is that is up to the lending institution um okay. all of the ones that i had previously worked with, with like um like the the big banks yeah required in-person inspection okay um but but to your point, that was because they all worked at this like at least million dollar plus level. Okay. Um, there, I mean the all the closest proxy to this is Boro. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think they had an in person requirement, but but I I do think Boro took possession of the work. It, yes, exactly. But, so they they'll agree to things in principle, but then they have you have to deliver them to where they're located before they'll they wire the money. Exactly. Um, so like that. Yeah. It, yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry, I don't I don't want to uh, monopolize the conversation, but uh, that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. No. No. This, this these questions are fun for me. You know. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Um. Yeah. Any anybody else have questions? Mark, I just had like a general question, like a very high level. Is it common practice for all artists to consult with an art appraiser? Or is that really just typical for like really established artists that are dealing with like very expensive work? Yeah, so it so really like the role that artists have played in the appraisal process has historically been um, very little. Um, I would argue that there's definitely a role for artists to play, um, at least on the primary market when they're selling their own work, just because, you know, you're trying to, whether you're an artist or you're like a platform attempting, uh, 
you know, selling work on the primary market. You want to give your buyers like a vote of confidence that what they're buying is um, has been like vetted in some way by a third party. Um, alternatively, you're dealing with um, people who are probably going to have to get this insured in some way. So having an appraisal on hand kind of close to or from the point of sale is really useful. Um, so I would say like really from a like a, a green fields of growth perspective in the world of appraisals, it's really kind of getting closer to like the point of sale. Great, thank you. And I said another question with art appraisals, is there a lot of room for variance? Like say like two different appraisers like look at the same piece of art, are they gonna come to like a very similar value or is there different room for interpretation? Uh, oh, that's a really good question. So basically, like uh, as you know, as recognized by USPAP, um, an appraiser is an appraisal is just the appraiser's opinion of value. And obviously, an opinion is just that it can fluctuate from one appraiser to another. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, though, you want like if you get like. Um, people have gotten like competing appraisals in the past uh, for lo a lot of things. And you generally want the values to kind of be around the same with, you know, minimal differences. Um, but there are times where kind of uh, the values differ tremendously. Awesome. Well, if no one's got any other questions, we're I'm happy to kind of give everyone back the last five minutes. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.